This is the third part of the lecture on point cloud analysis. Now we will move from point cloud to surfaces and discuss how to generate more structured uh, data representation from the point clouds. Uh, there are several different ways how to do it. <clears throat> the simplest one is binning. We already discussed using Purcell statistics to analyze the point cloud density. Here we can use similar approach to compute uh, mean point elevation per each grid cell resulting in a digital elevation model. We can also use the minimum z-value, maximum z-value or nearest point z-value to create surfaces. This approach is very fast and sufficient for many applications. You don't need to import the points. Uh, uh, very often this process is done on fly, but the results may be noisy and there may be no data areas. Another very common approach that you have already used when working with EGISoft PhotoScan is generating uh, a digital elevation model represented by triangular irregular network. These meshes are standard in 3D engineering and design systems. Uh, one reason why they are used so often is that they have variable resolution, so the size of triangles is based on terrain or surface complexity. It also allows variable level of detail for visualization. But the uh, two-dimensional triangulation, which is most often used for uh, generating tins, leads to geometry which is not optimal for three-dimensional representation. So as you will see, some of the objects are not properly represented, such as roads, or it creates artificial dams in valleys. And then additional processing or <clears throat> additional data are needed to create a uh, more representative digital elevation model. Also, also, these meshes are harder to combine with other geospatial data, and there is only limited analytics available, although it's growing. Uh, also, thin data are uh, harder to share because the ex compared to rasters, the exchange formats are quite limited. And finally, uh, we can get high quality digital elevation model by using uh, uh, robust and accurate interpolation techniques to convert points to raster representation. This approach supports resolution that is higher than point density, which is sometimes uh, an advantage, especially if we want to represent certain fine features. The results depend on the method used, so it can make quite a bit of difference for sparser data or if you have big voids in data. But because LiDAR data and the structure from motion point cloud is very dense, most methods work quite well. You need to keep in mind that the high resolution raster digital elevation models can be quite massive, but it works for most analytics and for visualization, these rasters are uh, usually converted to TIN. And of course, digital elevation models are really easy to share because there are uh, almost every software that deals with spatial data can read uh, raster data. So here are some examples. Uh, here you can see an example of binning at one meter resolution. So we had a point cloud uh, and uh, this point for this point cloud, we have converted it to raster representation by assigning the nearest neighbor point to the grid cell value. And you can see that for this particular quite old LiDAR data, uh, there are many cells with null values at one meter resolution. We also have a um, couple of uh, outliers here. So obviously, this is not a great representation. There is also a void, data void, where the survey was missed. Uh, this is, of course, not not great representation and we try to do something else to get a better digital elevation model. So one approach would be 
lowering the resolution and doing the binning at 3 meter resolution. You can see that at this resolution we are getting quite acceptable, a pretty good digital elevation model. There is still this void area, but otherwise for many applications 3 meter resolution uh, digital elevation model will be quite adequate. But we can also go beyond the uh, point density and we can interpolate this data at 1 meter resolution using, for example, the spline function. And you can see that the spline function actually captures the geometry uh, uh, which is uh, in the point, represented in the point cloud really well. Uh, so there are, for example, uh, fences buried in the sand in this area, but it also captures some point, some artifacts in the data. So you can notice here this line, and this line is not a trail, it is actually the swath overlap when you look here. Also you can see that the void in the data was, uh, was filled in, but uh, uh, but the, there are some artifacts and of course because there were no data we don't really have a good representation of the surface there. So we need to be careful about using uh, interpolating the voids in the data where we actually don't have the adequate information. Let's look now at the uh, triangular irregular network. So this is the thin representation of our midpoints data with low density uh, points. So you can see that the triangles are quite visible and the surface is very noisy and the, the individual features such as buildings are not very well represented but we can increase the density of points uh, in the point cloud so uh, using and generate high density uh, thin representation so with that you can see the cars here so now we are getting that information we can also see that that low area uh, next to the building was actually cars so this is much better representation but the, let's say, the, the top of the building, as you can see, it's very noisy. So it is still not very useful for a more detailed uh, uh, analysis. But uh, uh, to get a little bit better representation, we can smooth this thin, uh, thin to remove at least some of the noise. But we are also losing, with smoothing, we are also losing some of the detail. But another thing that we can do is we can take that high density point cloud, we can import it into GIS and we can use spline interpolation to do a high resolution digital elevation model. And this is a picture from one of the previous, uh, uh, previous surveys. So there is only one building uh, captured, but you can see that the detail and the uh, re representation of the geometry is much, much better than what we have, for example, here. So, so there is uh, sometimes, depending on your needs, uh, depending on the resolution and the representation that you would need uh, for your data, it may be an advantage to take the point cloud, bring it into a software that has better interpolation techniques, and uh, interpolate higher resolution digital uh, surface model than what, uh, let's say, the, uh, the photo scan or the structure from motion actually supports. So here is another uh, image of that interpolated digital surface model. This one is the LiDAR-based digital surface model. This one is uh, uh, UAS based the digital surface model and you can see the differences over time there were some trees removed here in this area and uh, also here we have some trees uh, uh, some trees mi missing and there is also vegetation growing in the fields 
while this is a bare ground representation, uh, while at this time this is not bare ground, it's a surface model because we have all these trees, but there is nothing growing in the field. So once we have the digital elevation model, we very often use this digital elevation model to derive some parameters uh, for either for further modeling or for decision making for planning. And uh, deriving topographic parameters from the uh, digital elevation models derived from point clouds have some challenges because uh, uh, the DEMs are often noisy so the, the parameters that you derive may reflect more noise or scan pattern rather than actual topography. And also the landforms usually span many cells, tens or hundreds of points or grid cells, rather than the standard three times three neighborhood that is often used to derive topographic parameters. That's why we can get better results uh, or we have more flexibility to derive, uh, uh, to derive topographic parameters using splines or using techniques that actually use uh, uh, different size of, or growing size of window. And uh, uh, with the spline function that you will be using in your assignment, you can compute the topographic analysis simultaneously with interpolation. And that way you are getting a consistent surface and topographic parameters. And there is a link to paper in your slides where you can read more about it. So here is an example. You may know this image if you have uh, uh, taken MEA 582. Here we show that with splines we can use different tension parameters to tune the level of detail in our uh, uh, digital elevation model and the derived parameters. So with high tension for curvature we will get this kind of pattern and you can see that in this pattern uh, uh, it's very hard to actually distinguish where is the valley, where is the shoulder, where are different features of this topography. But you can see here the lines, the scan lines. So they are reflected in the, uh, in the curvature pattern. And of course, it's artifacts. It's not really the features that we have in the topography. But by lowering the tension, you can get much better representation where the valleys, valley forms are much, uh, uh, much better represented. And you can also distinguish the curvatures on the, uh, where the vegetation is, where the trees are, and where there are certain features such as roads, which essentially uh, is a convex form, it's a ridge. And this little animation shows how with different uh, uh, parameters, uh, different tension parameters, you get different level of detail and how you can essentially remove the noise and smooth out some features as you are interpolating with uh, decreasing uh, uh, tension parameter. So, so the uh, results start, this is when you have very high tension, you are capturing the, the pattern of scanning and as you are increase, uh, lowering your tension, the surface gets smoothed out and you have the, the features that are actually there, like the topographic features, uh, uh, highlighted and extracted in a much better way. For example, this is the edge of dune, so dune crest and its slip face, or here we have the, uh, here we have the buried fences. Uh, in addition to surface analysis uh, with point clouds, especially with dense point clouds and LiDAR point clouds, we can perform a vertical uh, analysis of this point cloud as well. And because we have horizontal and vertical distribution of points, we can do this analysis in voxels, that means in 3D rasters. So we select a 3D resolution 
2D and the vertical resolution. And then <clears throat> analyze the number of points within these, uh, within the, these voxels. And one of, you can see how, these, uh, how the points are distributed within the, the vertical space. So you have lots of points captured on the, on the ground, but then you have also points distributed within the vegetation, which, within the trees, all the way up to the canopy. And this picture shows, uh, uh, shows one application of this point cloud analysis, and that's a 3D fragmentation index where the grid, based on the point cloud density, uh, uh, we can derive the interior, uh, interior space of the vegetation and transitional and edge spaces of your vegetation. And then you can use a full volume visualization and a cutting, play, uh, cutting plane, and you can move this cutting plane around the, the space and explore how the vegetation actually looks like in these different areas. So you can see the height of the, of the vegetation, like here, but you can also see whether there is or there isn't any understory vegetation. And I would like to show you uh, one additional data set uh, where this kind of analysis uh, was performed, and that's the uh, air, airborne LiDAR data from Mammoth Cave Park. Uh, what was unique about this data that it uh, uh, was a full waveform format, and then the waveform was converted into multiple returns. And uh, you can see on this illustration what the full waveform LiDAR means. That means that for each pulse, you are not getting just uh, uh, discrete returns, but you are getting entire function. And from this function, the, the peaks in the response are extracted, and this is where you are getting the returns. So this here you would get three returns. The last one is the bare ground. And the same can be done also uh, for LiDAR or, uh, that penetrates the water surface and is used for bathymetry. So here is the sample of Mammoth Cave Park uh, data. And you can see that this area has a very dense canopy. Uh, and these are the areas where the LiDAR is really, really uh, helps to reveal the surfaces that are not seen from the air, from aerial photography, and uh, where the uh, LiDAR provides superior advantage uh, compared to anything that is based on imagery. So, so this is the canopy. Uh, uh, profile curvature, for example, can be used to detect the individual crowns, but there are other ways how we can um, uh, detect the individual crown trees, and we may talk about that later. And here you can see the uh, uh, cross-section of the bare ground uh, uh, digital elevation model and the digital surface model with the canopy height. When we remove the, when we remove the trees, the vegetation, we can get down to the bare ground. And you can see that this reveals features that really were not visible in the digital surface model. And then we can use the voxel model, the voxel model approach to actually analyze the canopy and the, uh, the density of trees, the structure of the canopy, but also the vertical structure of the forest there. So I would like to finish this lecture with some notes about advances in LiDAR data uh, acquisition. So with the LiDAR, uh, uh, we have been working for many, many years with multiple return uh, uh, LiDAR data. Uh, now, what is also available are the waveform LiDAR. I have discussed it, what it is. Then single photon LiDARs, which are extremely dense uh, point clouds, uh, and they don't have multiple return because they are just so dense that they would penetrate all the way to the ground. 
and multispectral lidar which is uh, which is used especially in those areas where you need to map simultaneously bathymetry and the terrestrial environment from the point of view of uas uh, 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 the light and the different technology is really important and that's the LiDAR array. These uh, LiDAR array based technologies uh, allow to build small and light uh, LiDARs which are uh, which can be mounted on smaller uh, smaller unmanned aerial systems. So currently LiDAR is available for large UAS and for helicopters with pretty high accuracy. For the small UAS platforms, the systems are still lacking in terms of accuracy, but recently some new, new platforms were released where, we, uh, where the LiDAR is supposed to have uh, higher accuracy, but uh, that still remains to be seen. So uh, uh, at the end uh, of the lecture, there is a slide with LiDAR data sources and the best is to click on the link, uh, click on the link where we have on our website, we maintain the access to all kinds of LiDAR, uh, LiDAR point clouds that you can use, LiDAR point clouds and UA, um, UAS point clouds that you can use in your projects. Thank you.